should have just let them keep playing. Wasn't that great? I don't know that we were very much blessed. Uh, we got a bunch of rain, and there are other people that did not. So this morning, I definitely want to say thank you, Lord, for that. Today, I do want you to know that our theme last week was commitment, and today it's being a disciple. So all of our songs are going to be about serving the Lord. So sing right along with us and welcome today. Welcome you this morning to West Box I Mission Baptist Church and our worship service. So thankful to see you all here this morning and so glad to see smiling faces. Um, I would like to just make you aware, next week we'll have a box in the foyer for our uh, trunk or treat. So if you don't want to participate in trunk or treat, then you can bring candy and donate that and such. Uh, and that will probably be on October 30th. So it'll be that Saturday before Halloween. Halloween falls on a Sunday this year. So our trunk or treat will probably be on October 30th, that Saturday. We'll have more information, but there will be a box next week uh, in the foyer where you can come and bring candy and, and donate if you'd like to. And then also right after a prayer, the, I guess the choir will come up. 
right? And the choir will come up, and then our junior church uh, kids will head to the back with Brother Toby. But just want you to be aware of those things, um, and so you can be in prayer for them. And also, pray for our church members. This week, uh, if you're not on the, the email list, there's a lot of prayer requests and requests for prayer going out through the, the email list. So if you're not on that, then please see Sister Debbie and get hooked up on that so you can be praying as well. Uh, Mr. De- Miss Debbie does a very good job of keeping us informed when you know surgeries are coming and what time they are and, and sends out reminders to pray for surgery. So if you're not on the email list and you'd like to be, please see her and get connected that way so you can be praying with us for our church members that are uh, in I- illness and sickness and disease. So uh, if you're not in, uh, tied into that, then I would encourage you to be tied in. Or uh, you leave here, go ahead and, and see her. Uh, let's go ahead and open in prayer, and then we'll continue our worship this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for the day you've given us, and we're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity to gather in your house. Father, we pray, Lord, that as we gather here, we can follow you closely, and in spirit and truth, Lord, we pray we've assembled to worship you here this morning. Father, we pray for our church that you would lead us, and that we would listen and uh, follow your Holy Spirit's guidance, and that we would do everything in accordance to your will. Father, we pray for the preaching of your word, and we also pray, Lord, for the churches in our area that seek to build up your kingdom. Father, we pray you bless their efforts as well as ours, and that together we would uh, build up your kingdom, reach lost souls, and proclaim your gospel message. Father, we pray that if there's someone here that's lost and has never placed their faith or trust in you, Father, we pray that the, that this morning that your Holy Spirit would convict them of the need for a Savior, they would realize that Jesus is the only way, and they would place their faith and trust in you alone. Father, we're so thankful for your death on the cross. We're so thankful for sending Jesus so that he could become our Savior and our Lord through his sacrifice. Father, we love you, we thank you, and we worship you this morning. Forgive us our sins, and it's Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mr. Christian.
morning, I'd like to go ahead and invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Acts. This year we've been working through the book of Acts, and we come to chapter 20. And being a pastor, I've realized that there are stereotypes that go around. And maybe you don't know what I'm talking about. But when people hear you're a pastor, or people um, figure out that you're a pastor, or however it happens... They tend to treat you differently. And I don't think they mean to. They just do. And when they figure out that you're a normal person, it changes things. I was recently getting my hair cut, and um, we started talking about TV shows. And she didn't figure it out. I guess watch TV shows like I do. And I do. I watch TV shows. Um, I've seen movies. I've gone to concerts. I know. It's weird, isn't it? People, our kids, are, our kids are hilarious. I'm trying to get my microphone clipped on if you see me fidgeting up here. But people, uh, kids are, I think it's hilarious. They think I live at church. <laughs> There's that one. I do have a house, in case you were wondering. I'm not constantly in my Bible. I should be, but I'm not. I'm a real person. And I do watch movies. I know that's crazy. Have you ever seen those movies where maybe a soldier or a spy or someone's going to do something daring you know what they always do? If I don't come back, you tell my blah, 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 I love them. Right? About to rush in front of the train. You make sure my mom knows that I love her. Make sure my wife knows that I love her. Tell my family I love them. And they never die. They always make it. They always live. But if you were in that situation, if you knew that this was going to be it, and this was going to be the last time you talked to someone, what would you say? kind of a hard question, and that's, I think, why death is such a hard thing to grasp. Do I like death? No, it's called an enemy for a reason. It's a terrible thing. It breaks families, it breaks relationships, it breaks lives. Death is a terrible thing, but what makes it harder is when it's unexpected, when you weren't expecting it to happen, and you start replaying in your mind, if if I would have said this, If I would have done this, had I known that would have been the last time I saw blank. And that's what we regret. Right? It's not the life they lived. We're thankful that they had an impact on our life. But it's that I wasn't able to tell them I love them. Say goodbye. And so we think about things like that and it hurts. And then we go through life and we don't take the opportunities that are presented to us where we don't know if I'm going to see you again. I don't know if I'm going to tell you goodbye ever again. I don't know what will happen. And so if you were in that position, and this was the last time you saw someone, what would you say? And that's precisely where we find Paul in Acts chapter 20. We are starting this long trek of a journey towards Jerusalem, and awaiting him are chains prison, tribulation, death, and we're getting ready to go through it with him. And he has a chance in Acts chapter 20 to tell people he knows he'll never see again a message he wants them to understand. Now chapter 20 is broken into two different uh, things. You see two different travel summaries and you see two different times Paul is ministering in the churches. So verses 1 through 6, Paul is traveling. And so after the Ephesus riot, is really what it's called, a riot, a terrible uproar in the city, he called the disciples to himself, so he calls the church to himself. He embraced them, and he departed to go to Macedonia. Now when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece. He stayed there three months, and when the Jews plotted against him as he was about to sail to Syria he decided to return through Macedonia. And Sopater of Berea accompanied him to Asia, also Aristarchus and Secundus of the Thessalonians, Gaius of Derbe, Timothy and Tychicus, and Trophimus of, of Asia. These men going ahead waited for us at Troas. So we, once again we picked up Luke. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread, and in five days joined them at Troas where we stayed seven days. 
And so we end up in Troas, and there's something that happens in Troas that Luke wants us to understand, and it's probably my favorite application in the Bible. In verse 7, On the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. So Paul knows he's leaving. He knows he's about to depart, and he's not sure if he's coming to Troas again. So he knows he's leaving. He meets them on the first day of the week. They break bread, and Paul begins to preach to them. And we look at that, and we say, well, his message lasted until midnight. Take a breath. It's probably only a five-hour sermon. And we say that because there's actually been records of preachers saying that I was speaking for five hours until midnight. So it was probably a five-hour sermon. So he has five hours to tell them what he wants them to know before he departs Troas the next day. In verse 8, there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. And in a window sat a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep. That's where a lot of the Baptist amens come in. Five hours later, this man's getting tired. And so he's sitting in a window, he's sinking into a deep sleep, and he was overcome by sleep. And as Paul continued speaking, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. That took a drastic turn, didn't it? I want you to picture that. You're in the third story. There's lamps and candles all around you. Paul is going on and on and on. Ever been in a sermon where you're hungry? The preacher goes on and on. He should have finished 20 minutes ago. He's on and on. And so he's getting sleepy. His eyes are getting heavy. And he falls asleep. And he wakes up dead. He falls three stories, and he dies. So verse, tw- uh, verse 10, when, But Paul went down, fell on him, embracing him. So do not trouble yourselves, for, this li- for his life is in him. So Paul goes, and it's an allusion back to, the, to, to kings with Elijah and with Elisha. They go, they, they lean over the body, they lay on the body, and life comes back into them. They heal these people. And so when he had come up, verse 11, had broken bread and eaten and talked a long while, even till daybreak, he departed. And they brought the young man in alive, and they were not a little comforted. Paul was a preacher at heart. He was preaching. He had a funeral to preach. He healed him. He created a miracle. And he kept preaching. You know the application of this story? Don't fall asleep during the sermon. It's the easiest application ever. Now, there's two reasons this this is in here. The first one is that Luke wants us to understand Paul is still doing what God has called him to do. The reason Paul was able to resuscitate him, bring him back to life, is because God gave him the ability to. Paul didn't have the power to unless God gave it to him. And so in keeping with the prophets and keeping with Jesus, this is a verification that Paul is still doing what the Lord has called him to do. And that was to be an apostle, be an evangelist, and be a church planner. But the second one is interesting. In verse 8, there's a record of there were many lamps in the upper room where they were gathered together. Back in this time, nocturnal meetings were not a good thing. They were associated with pagans and with cults. And also associated with that was killings, with sacrifices. And so there's a secondary purpose here that Luke is trying to get us to understand that this was a beneficial meeting of the church. It was not a meeting of a cult or of another religion, of a sacrificial system. There was a lot of lights going on. It was decent. It was in order. Paul was ministering to the churches. He understood he was getting ready to leave, and he was telling the church what he wanted them to understand before he left. And so then in verse 13, we start the second travel summary. It says, he went ahead to the ship and sailed to Asus, there uh, intending to take Paul on board. So he had given orders, intending himself to go on foot. And when we met him at Asus, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. We sailed from there, and the next day came opposite Chios. The following day, we arrived at Samos and stayed at Trogilium. The next day, we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus, so he would not have to spend time in Asia for he was hurrying to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. And so from there, in verse 17, he sent to Ephesus, and he called for the elders of the church. 
And so he's here in this city. He's trying to make it to Jerusalem to get there before the day of Pentecost. But he takes time here. He sends to the Ephesian church, and he wants them to bring back their elders. He wants the elders to come to him. And so in verse 18, when they had come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. Paul breaks his speech up here in several different parts, but this first one he begins talking about his past record, what he did in the past. He says, I came here, and you know what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says, when I came to you, first off, I came as a servant. The idea of a servant here was someone who is enslaved, uh, who is, is captured and cannot depart. And so he said, I came here serving as a servant of the Lord. And I came here with all humility I came here with many tears and trials, all because of what the Jews were plotting to do to me. But verse 20, he says, I kept back nothing that was helpful. He said, I didn't try to shield you from anything I went through. I didn't try to cover up what I went through. I tried to give you everything I could that would helpful, be helpful to you and be beneficial. He said, I proclaimed it to you, and I taught you. He says in verse 21, I also testified to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, in times past when I came to you, I've done several things. I taught you, I encouraged you, I served the Lord, but most of all, I testified. What I did, I bore witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I bore witness of repentance toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Our church needs to be teaching. Our church needs to be preaching. But our church must be witnessing about our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said, I was testifying to the Jews. I was testifying to the Greeks. I was bearing witness. Yes, I gave you those things that were helpful, but I was testifying. He says in verse 22, he starts talking about the present. He says, and see now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God." See, Paul presently understands he's going to Jerusalem. He feels kind of captured. He's taking, he feels bound in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is leading him to Jerusalem. He's going that way, and he understands that trials, tribulations are waiting him, persecutions awaiting him. He understands. But you see what happens in verse um, 24? He says, none of these things move me. None of these things scare me. None of these things deter me from my, my purpose. Why? Because I don't count my life dear to myself. Some of us, our life is the most prized possession that we have. We have our life. We don't want to die. We don't want to be in pain. We don't want to endanger ourselves. But Paul says, I don't count it that way. I don't count my life mine. He says, I want to finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus Christ. He understood that his sole purpose here was to be a minister for the Lord Jesus Christ and to testify, verse 24, to the gospel of the grace of God. When you become a child of God, you realize something, that your life is no longer your own. Why? Because of God's grace being merciful and gracious to you, in turn, you become not your own, but purchased. You become redeemed. 
And so Paul says, my life is not my own. All I want to do is be faithful. I want to finish my race. I want to continue to do my ministry. What has God called you to do? What is the ministry the Lord has waiting for you that you need to be fulfilling? But maybe your idea of your life is getting in the way. Maybe you count your life too dear to continue doing what God has wanted you to do. What is it that the Lord is trying to bind you to? He's trying to hold you to. He's trying to get you to do, but we won't allow him to do. What is it? And then he continues on in verse 25 with a future prediction. He says, Indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. What Paul says is basically, I have done my job to you. I have been with you, I have preached to you, and I didn't stop telling you the whole counsel of God. You wanted to know the law, I taught you the law. You wanted to know the grace of Jesus, I taught you the grace of Jesus. You want to know the application of the Bible? I taught you the application of the Bible. I taught you everything. And so if I go to court one day before the Lord God Almighty, I am innocent. Because when I stood before you, I did what I was called to do. I preached to you the gospel. I preached to you the whole counsel of God. And I didn't shrivel up. I didn't shrink back. I was faithful and I did my job. And then he starts with a charge in verse 28. He says, therefore, so because of this, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. He says, therefore, he's talking to the elders, those that were over the church, kind of helped the church, shepherding the church. He says, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. He says in verse 28, to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The church is an important organization. It's not important because I say it's important. It's not important because you say it's important. It's not important because your grandparents or your parents said it was important. It's important because God thinks it's important. It's important because Jesus died for his church. And so we have a responsibility as a church to maintain our importance in the community. The, the community should think we're important. The community should think that we are essential. Why? Because we have a job here to do. We have a purpose. And so he tells those uh, that are shepherding the flock. He says, take heed for yourselves into the flock. To shepherd the church of God. You have a responsibility. You're to preach. You're to teach. You're to lead. You're to guide. Basically, you are to feed the flock. You're to do everything in your power to shepherd these people. And then he talks about verse 29. He keeps going. He says, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day. So he starts talking about this future presentation once again. He says, I know that when I leave, wolves are going to come in. And that is a natural uh, respons- responsibility of a, of a wolf. If the dog leaves, if the fence has a hole in it, the wolf will find a way in. He says, when I leave here, there are going to be wolves that come into the fold, come in among the sheep, and they're going to try to do some things. He says, they're going to, to be savage wolves. They're going to come in, and they're not going to spare the flock. They're not going to care about them. They're not going to, be to, to care about what really happens to them. They're just being wolves. They're just being themselves. So for verse 30, he says, From among yourselves men will rise up 
speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. He says, after I depart, people are going to come in this church. They're going to rise up through the ranks. They'll want to be teachers, and you'll put them in as a teacher. They'll want to be preachers, and you'll place them in the pulpit. They'll want to have these roles, and they won't teach what needs to be taught. They will teach perverse things, things that are twisted, things that aren't accurate, things that aren't truthful. And, and as a result of this, in verse 30, it says that they will actually draw away the disciples, not after God, not after Jesus, but after themselves. And if you draw people to certain individuals, you know what you seek or you cease to have? A church. This is very dangerous. So because of this in verse 31, Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So verse 32, he starts talking about the present once more. He says, So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you inheritance among all those who were sanctified. And he starts talking about his past in verse 33. He said, I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I have shown you in every way by laboring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And so Paul begins talking. He says, when I came to you, I didn't come to be a, bur a burden on you. I didn't come seeking your gold or your silver or your apparel or your, uh, your things. He said, instead, I labored. I worked with my own hands. And so, really, I've been an example to you in every way. By laboring like this, that you, may, that you must support the weak. You must, be there, you must be there for those who aren't able to. And so part, Paul begins really with a few applications in this, in this passage, or a few principles. The first one he tells the shepherds that they need to feed the flock. They are to act as a shepherd. They are to take the flock of God, follow the Lord, follow the shepherd, and guide that flock to where the Lord wants them to go. But that also means protecting them from ravaging wolves and savage wolves and things that seek to hurt the church. And so he tells them, verse 29 to 31, that they need to be alert. They need to be watchful. They need to pay attention. We have a responsibility because this doesn't just fall on the shepherds and on those in leadership positions. It falls on everyone. Because false doctrine can sneak into the church through anyone. If you hear it on the radio and it sounds good, be careful, it may be false doctrine. If you hear it on a video, be careful, it may be false doctrine. If you read it in a Facebook post, be careful, it may be false doctrine. And so we have a responsibility to not only feed those and, and, and shepherd those, but also to be watchful. Paul says that I have really been an example of, in this. I've been an example of everything I've told you. The first one, he says that you're to feed the flock. I came in, I taught you, I proclaimed, I testified, I fed you, I shepherded you. I did everything I could for you. And the second thing, he says, was to be alert for danger. The reason he called this meeting was because he saw dangers coming. And so this was his way to stand against those dangers, to take precaution, and to warn them of what was coming, what was going to happen. And in verse 33 through 35... He says, really, you shouldn't be greedy or in it for gain. The church is not the place to become rich. The church is not the place to try to gain yourself monetarily. It's an important organization, but it has an even, even more important message. And so he tells them, don't be greedy. He says, when I came to you, I worked with my hands. I worked with my skills. I worked with my abilities so that I didn't covet anyone else's stuff. And through this, I was able to help those that were weak. 
And so in verse 36, he said all these things. He knelt down. He prayed with them all. And then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. So what can we learn? Well, firstly, we don't have Paul here. So just as this church was in uh, really an able place or could have been kept, crept into, we too can be crept into by false, by false teaching and by false doctrines. And so what that means is that our teachers need to be on guard for what they teach. Our members need to be on guard for what is taught and preached. You shouldn't trust my word for it. I get a lot of things messed up. I get a lot of things backwards. I think I just misspoke that sentence. I mess up. And so you should not believe anything I say simply because I believe it. You should believe what you believe simply because the Bible says it. You shouldn't put your fault, your, your belief and your, and your thought system into a preacher or a person or a teacher or a radio evangelist. You should find it for yourself. Because if you find it for yourself, you'll be able to hear something and discern whether it's right or wrong. Creation was made in 17 years. I don't think that's what the Bible says. Paul was not a missionary. Well, I don't think that's what the Bible says. But if you don't know the Bible, then you are in danger of hearing false doctrine. And so when I preach, you should follow along. You should see if you agree with what I say. You should see if you agree with what the Bible says. And if you have a problem with anything I say, bring it up to me. That's fine. But if you have a problem with what the Bible says, then you can't take it up with me. Because I didn't write it. And so we have a duty here as a church to study the Word of God, to preach the Word of God. But above all, we have a responsibility to witness of the message of God. Why? Because just like Paul, we're not sure how long we'll be here. I'm not sure how long I'll stand in this pulpit. I'm not sure how long I'll be in the ministry. I don't know. Some of you don't know how long you'll be teaching a Sunday school class or being in attendance here. We don't know. And so while we have the opportunity to talk to our family, to talk to our loved ones, we need to make sure that above all, they know the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul understood what was waiting for him. He understood chains, persecution, all kinds of beautiful matter that sounds like a vacation were waiting for him. And he took this opportunity to tell the church that they need to be on guard. But above all, they need to testify of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray here this morning that we testify of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But when we leave here, do our lives demonstrate, do our lives show the world that Jesus Christ is my Savior, is my Lord? Oftentimes we don't. And then when someone passes, and maybe it's uh, someone who doesn't believe in the Lord, I don't want you to have that thought and say, I wish I would have told them. I wish I would have told them about Jesus. Why? Paul says, I never shrunk back. I never shunned. I never came to the background if the gospel was on the line. I proclaimed it all. All of it means that you're a sinner. All of it means that you have fallen short of the standard of God. But it doesn't stop there. It continues and says that God loved you so much that he sent Jesus into the world who bore the sins on the cross, who bore your shame, bore your sins, bore your, fault, your faults, died as a sacrifice for you. But he rose up on that third day. And because of his resurrection, we have two hopes. Firstly, that when we place our faith and trust in Jesus, the hope of the resurrection gives me hope that God counted Jesus faithful to be a sacrifice, so he counts me faithful to place my faith and trust in him as a, as a son, as an heir. But that second hope is that we will have a relationship with God in eternity. And the scary thing is, is none of us know when we'll enter into eternity. We never know. And so before you leave here this morning, 
don't have an opportunity to trust Jesus as Savior, don't have an opportunity to believe in the Lord Jesus, to have your sins forgiven, have your slate wiped clean, and put it off one more day. We always wait for a more convenient time. We'll wait for a comfier church. Or we'll wait for a better preacher. Or we'll wait for a different sermon. But Jesus is waiting for you this morning, wanting you to be saved, wanting to be your Savior. But you have to make that decision. You have to be the one to say, Here I am, Lord. I'm ready for a relationship with you. I'm ready to be your child. Here in just a moment after we pray, you'll have that very opportunity. When we sing here in just a moment, you'll have the opportunity, if you'd like to, to come forward, place your faith and trust in Jesus as your Savior. Or maybe you need to be baptized. Maybe you need to be a member of this church and be on guard with us to stand against false doctrine. What is the Lord, what is the Holy Spirit convicting you to do this morning? Would you bow in prayer with me? Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the encouragement that Paul passed to the elders of Ephesus. Father, we understand that we have a responsibility here, and that really every church has a responsibility to stand against false doctrines, to test everything against your word. And Father, we pray, Lord, that we can be found faithful in everything we do. Father, we pray during this time of invitation that your Holy Spirit would convict us to correct where we need to, Father. Lord, if it's baptism or church membership, Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would draw us and convict us. But Father, if it's salvation, we pray, Lord, that the Holy Spirit would convict those. And Father, we pray so earnestly this morning that they would come to know you as Savior, that they would realize their need of Jesus, repent of their sin, and place their faith and trust in you. For that is the greatest decision and the greatest thing they'll ever do. Lord, we pray this morning that we would respond accordingly to your will. Father, forgive us of our sin and forgive us where we fail you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you stand, please?